My name's Chip Chapin. Uh, I'm an engineer on uh, Google Maps, and uh, I'd uh, like to introduce uh, Neil Seiki, the uh, founder and uh, CTO of Zero Motorcycles. I'll let uh, Neil uh, really introduce himself more properly, but uh, I want to thank you all for coming out, and thank you, Neil. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I always heard a lot about the Google campus, and this is my first time here, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting to meet all you guys. And, uh, to see if all the rumors are really true about what goes on over here. So, uh, you know, I'd like to kind of, it's kind of have an informal talk here, and, uh, you know, you guys can tell me kind of more about what you want to hear about, uh, because um, I've got a lot of stuff. Um, I've designed uh, this electric motorcycle and this company, but I've also done a lot of product development, and uh, I'm willing to talk about everything you, anything you guys want to talk about, uh, whether it's uh, business development kind of topics or battery related topics, you know, because we've got a small crowd here. Um, I think I'll talk for a little bit and then we can have question and answer and, you know, you guys, um, if you have a burning question, you guys can, can certainly uh, stop me and uh, I'll try to expound on anything you want. But uh, my talk is electric motorcycles and other cool stuff, uh, just because I wanted to frame this with the idea that um, you know, I didn't just create this motorcycle in a vacuum. I didn't take a gas-powered motorcycle and stick a battery pa pack in it. It was really a ground-up design, uh, which really involved a lot of skills, a lot of product development that I've been doing for 20 years with my own product development company. So I thought it was important that I, I kind of go through my history, a little history about stuff I've designed, and kind of uh, will let you give you an idea of my thought process and how I overcame the, the problems with designing electric motorcycles and, and how we got to where we are today. One of, the, one of the first things I did when I was in college uh, was I was the project manager and, and chief designer for a human-powered helicopter. And uh, this was the, the first ever successful human-powered helicopter. And uh, I have a master's in aeronautical engineering. And really, uh, the thing that enabled this helicopter to get off the ground, and, and really, if you think about it, this is a major accomplishment. I mean, it's one thing to fly an airplane forward, but to, to lift yourself straight off the ground purely by your own power is just... It's an order of magnitude of more difficulty than an airplane. And this thing required a really, really strong structure because uh, what you can't see in this photo is the, the wingspan of that rotor is 100 feet in diameter. So it's just this massive uh, uh, spar, all carbon, carbon fiber. You know, we made it in the same, uh, same clean room that uh, the space shuttle boom arm is made from. It's got like $100,000 worth of carbon fiber in it. And, uh, it's used, uh, and it really pushed the limits of carbon fiber structure technology and, uh, and airframe um, structural dynamics. And, and really, it was a, really a great way to, to, to show that uh, you could make helicopters really, really efficient, I mean, much more efficient than any other helicopter out there. You know, I think we calculated this is sometimes uh, something like 300 times more of a power to weight ratio than a, a conventional helicopter technology. So uh, it was an interesting project for you know, combining aerodynamics and structural analysis. Uh, but I also worked on other things. Uh, uh, after I, uh, college, uh, I went to work on, I, I had a friend who was a flight test engineer, and uh, he was actually the pilot of this uh, airplane that was developed by the uh, German government in cooperation with the United States government to, uh, well, its, its primary mission was really a spy aircraft. Uh, it was a low-cost, kind of a poor man's U-2 aircraft that could do surveillance at 80,000 plus feet, you know, where you couldn't get shot down easily by missiles and things like that. And, uh, but the other use for this was um, the National Geographic Society uh, purchased these airplanes to do the, really the first uh, close examinations of the ozone layer, the depletion of the ozone layer, because it could fly uh, incredibly high and it wasn't flying so fast that it was heating up there. They could take uh, atmospheric samples from 86,000 feet. And what, what happened was uh, a friend of mine who was the head of taking the first flight in this thing, he came to me with the problem of, you know, he obviously, his first concern you know, more than setting an altitude record was to not die. And, the, and these flight tests of these kind of crazy, um, you know, state-of-the-art airplanes are, are actually incredibly dangerous for these test pilots. And one of the problems with this airplane, this airplane also has a 100-foot wingspan, was that uh, in that atmosphere at 80,000 feet, the air is so thin, there's just nothing to push on. Your, your propeller's almost going supersonic. Uh, you're, you're pushing as hard as you can onto almost nothing, no air resistance to keep the plane aloft. If it gets into an uncontrollable situation, a spin situation, you have so much inertia on there, he was very worried that he'd never recover. He would just spin it right into the ground and, and die. 
because there are so much, uh, there's so much yaw mo motions and there's so many complex d dynamics that you can't really model successfully with a computer. So I, I designed this model. I thought, well, let's, let's, let's model it with a 10-foot scale model and we'll instrument it and figure out the forces. And, and we've learned some really interesting stuff about how that when it did get into a spin, there was almost a, uh, you know, the amount of Gs that you'd have laterally in this aircraft in a, in a spin was almost lethal. And uh, what we did is I designed a drag chute uh, for the back where the pilot could open a drag chute and get the plane pointed straight down and stop it from spinning. And at least with the plane straight down, he could, be, he could, have, he could gain enough velocity to re regain uh, control on the uh, flying surfaces in order to pull it up out of a dive. So it was a... It was a kind of a, a, a modification to the airplane really for safety and really to allow this airplane to you know, explore the outer regions of our atmosphere. And a really interesting project. And that was at the time uh, uh, I, was, I was working with him and I was also working at NASA doing a lot of uh, um, research, pure, pure research. I did a lot of uh, laminar flow, uh, aerodynamics kind of research. But I also got to do a, um, a study with the state of California looking into um, transportation solutions for the California corridor. And we were examining electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, uh, conventional gas engines, gas turbines, things like that, and examining them from a, a California policy level as to what should the state of California fund uh, from a bond initiative kind of perspective in order to put in the infrastructure to allow us to get away from the gasoline engine. Because e even, even when I was doing this project and working for NASA 20-some years ago, you know, there was a big impetus for cleaning up the environment. It's something that's been around for 30, 40 years. Uh, I think even at the time we, we did uh, public uh, um, opinion, public opinion surveys and found that 30, the, th the environment was still like the number one concern for people even 30 years ago. So this is not a, not a new phenomenon, the clean tech phenomenon and the environmental movements. It's really something I've really been waiting for, uh, waiting to come to a head for our governments to do something about it, for private industry to make vehicles that are, you know, clean for the environment and fun and provide a practical solution and working in conjunction with the U.S. government and state, state governments to provide a, you know, some sort of solutions because obviously it's not enough to just you know, want to be green and want to have a clean uh, car. You've got to have a, a good alternative that is cost effective and reliable and all the things that you really need to practically have a revolution you know, if you want to clean up the environment. So this one, uh, uh, this is the Egret, uh, which I, I want to say is built about 25 years ago, 20, 20 years ago, something like that. Uh, and it was kind of not well covered, obviously, because this is a semi-secret project, uh, um, you know, because it did have a lot of uh, high-altitude reconnaissance uh, uh, missions. But they built two airplanes. This was the 100-foot version of the airplane, and they built a 130-foot version called the Stratus. And... Uh, I think the only photos I ever saw of this thing was on Aviation Week, that magazine that has all the, we used to call it Aviation Leak, because they always were taking photos of every, every top secret project at the end of, you know, they always camped out at the end of the runway, wherever we're at, taking pictures of these top secret vehicles and then publishing them in this, uh, this, this magazine. So it's not a well-known thing, but it is in the, the records. The record book says, uh, um, still ha holds the world altitude record. So why is there a windshield? Oh, this is the model of it. Oh. Um, so the, the real actual airplane had the, uh, this is the scale model that we, we developed. And an interesting project, we had to, had to scale not only the aerodynamic surfaces and the, and the volume of it, but scale the inertias. So we, we had to scale up the, the mass moment of inertia on all the axes so that it was a, a real true flying model. And then put it into these spins and dives and, and see if you could really recover. Because you could learn a lot about the handling characteristics of, of aircrafts. It's a very, um, it's a very difficult science, uh, computational fluid dynamics. I think people don't realize how, um, how really early in the, uh, in the process we are with computers having enough power to really handle tough computational fluid dynamic problems, especially when we get to these, you know, these, these border conditions where we're running almost supersonic, where viscosity is a large factor. It's, you know, it's easy to predict in viscid flow. You know, we don't have the viscosity of the, the liquid, but uh, accounting, accounting for all the real, real world, world factors like air heating and viscosity and uh, um, transonic behavior of, of airflow, we're, we're actually you know, quite in the early stages of getting computers that have enough computational power to fully predict handling characteristics of uh, full, full blown aircrafts. So we're still, we still rely a lot on models and uh, feel the pants.
<laughs> you know, simulations and take your best get, guess and build an airplane and send a test pilot up and hope he doesn't die kind of thing. That's a, there's still a lot of just, you know, really hairy flight tests that goes on that uh, a lot of the companies don't really talk about. But yeah, there's a lot of test, uh, test pilot stuff that gets trashed and they rely on outside testing companies to come in and, and fly these aircraft. And then um, some, one of the crazy things I did is I've developed a lot of products with my um, product development company, but I, I'm always been, I've always been an avid mountaineer, uh, rock climber, and I've, I've climbed up El Cap and Half Dome, and you know, I've cr traveled around the United States climbing and just spent months climbing. Anyway, I, I developed uh, these lightweight um, sleeping units for sleeping on the side of the mountain. Like you know, if you ever go to Yosemite, you see guys you know, pinned up on the side of that sheer cliff 2,000 feet up. And, and, and sleeping in it. And what it was is coming up with a really lightweight, uh, high-tech structures uh, that could, could easily be unfolded and, and working with exotic metals like titanium and aluminum. And I've got a patent on this and sold it to the biggest rock climbing equipment company in the world. And they, they've been producing these things. I think they just recently stopped, stopped making it. But I, but I, uh, I had uh, uh, a, just a little, I've done a lot of different products and it's just an example of how lightweight structures I was able to apply it to a different kind of consumer product and and then I built similar versions for special forces uh, for for stretcher units um, you know to try to replace the uh, really heavy stretchers for for soldiers wounded in battle they need to whip out a stretcher very quickly and get people off the battlefield since their their policy is to leave no one behind uh, they, they really have a big problem of uh, burdening down people with these heavy stretchers and getting them off of uh, the battlefield battlefield So, which brings me to mountain bikes. So, a little bit closer to electric motorcycles, but kind of give you the, the full scope of what I've done with my career. Is, uh, I started designing mountain bikes uh, a while ago, I guess 18 years ago you know, or so ago. And I'd, work, I'd do, a, do other products at the same time. But uh, I developed a lot of mountain bike technology because I've always been an avid motorcyclist. I really wanted to bring full suspension technology to mountain bikes. And like this, this particular bike I designed with Santa Cruz Mountain Bikes, you know, it, it won a half dozen national road cup titles and it's probably one of the longest running full suspension bikes out there in production. It was really a, a landmark uh, kind of full suspension bike, but we, we took a standard rigid mo mountain bike frame and put front suspension on it and rear suspension and worked out all the pivots and linkages so that you could pedal it and you could have an active front and rear suspension. So uh, really provides a lot more of a, fun ride and you can go over really rough terrain but it was a it was something that I you know motorcycles have always really been more dear to my heart but I, I've been spending a lot of time designing mountain bikes and I've, I uh, work with a lot of suspension designers and uh, uh, shock manufacturers to come up with different bikes and like this bike uh, was bike of the year for 2006 and I've designed a lot of products really at the, the very highest end of the mountain bike industry to, to push the technology this is a patent I have uh, for a virtual linkage system, uh, meaning that it, it's got more than, a, uh, more than the standard three bars or two bars for the, the linkage system. It's got a four bar linkage system, uh, which means that it doesn't always pivot on the same location. The, the center of rotation for the swing arm moves as it goes through its travel. So it's got what's called a virtual pivot because it, it moves as it goes through its stroke. But it was, a, it, was an, it was an example of really thinking out of the box here for this industry about what we could do with uh, a different kind of mechanical system to really give a, an unexpected result for the uh, suspension industry and that, that uh, you know, won the bike of the year and the uh, Haro mountain bike still sells a, a full product line of bikes based on this uh, suspension technology and you know, we're still going strong with that. But that was kind of what I did before and in the last five or I guess six years now I've been developing electric motorcycles. First in my garage, and uh, and then later forming the company in January 2006, and it was really uh, like I was talking about. It was really my desire to to combine uh, my research at NASA with my love of motorcycles. And uh, one of the big questions I had to ask myself was why why electric? And this is something we we studied at NASA. And really, the uh, electric powertrain really has so many advantages compared to everything else: hydrogen and and turbines and and any other, uh, you know, even the hybrid technologies. Uh, because the power to weight potentials are just incredible. Uh, one of the things that I found in doing my research uh, uh, 25 years ago or 20 years ago 
was that um, the military had uh, torpedo motors for you know pushing torpedoes through the water. They're 300 horsepower motors, which are about this big, and they're tiny, tiny motors. And they were the, the military had already developed electric engines that were incredibly small and powerful for pushing <laughs> pushing weapons through the water. Um, so it really was just I was just waiting for all of the military technology to come become uh, available to the private sector. So I knew that power to weight rate weight ratio potential was incredible and it was definitely already developed, just needed to get out to the private sector. Um, electric vehicles, of course, greenhouse gases are just a fraction of what you develop with a gasoline engine. I, I know people say, well, it, you're generating electricity and in the United States we have coal-fired power plants, but even a coal-fired power plant in the United States, even given the line losses of electricity that goes from the coal-fired fired power plant to your home, experiences a 3% uh, line loss, and plus of all the little transition losses, it's still like seven times more clean than a burning gasoline in an automobile. And it's, it's because burning gasoline in an engine is just so in, inefficient. It's such an incredibly inefficient use of that power. Only 25% of it goes into actually driving the vehicle forward. So much of it just goes into heating the air and making noise and, and going out the tailpipe. So electric drivetrains make so much sense. And, and then there's practical considerations like mechanical reliability. My electric motors have one moving part in them. I mean, there's just there's very little to go wrong versus uh, uh, designing a gas motor with all these pistons and hot parts that are falling apart and vibrating themselves to death. When you think about it, uh, you know, there's, there's no way I could have ever designed a gas engine. I still, to this day, I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to design all the pieces in a gas engine. It's just so incredibly technical and it's only because it's been around for a hundred years that, that gas engines are the dominant form of transportation. But if you had to start from scratch, there's no way you'd develop a gas engine. It's just way too complicated. There's too many moving parts and too many parts to fatigue, and they're all metal and subject to these thermal problems, and it's just a, a, a big mess. But electric motors are a single moving part, the rotor uh, operating within a magnetic field that doesn't wear out. It's really uh, elegant simplicity. And that's the last point about it is uh, electric motors also have a, a much broader speed range, an RPM range, than, than gasoline engines. So there, there's, it, it's so much more applicable for vehicles because you can go from a standstill to top speed and have constant power uh, all the way through that range. Uh, you, you, this, like these motors uh, are, are current limit in their first little initial part of the startup, but, but after that you've got all of the torque available uh, basically all the time. But there were a few challenges when I wanted to develop this, and really it was about battery capacity and battery safety. You know, at 10 years ago, we just had lead-acid batteries, which, of course, are just really, really heavy compared to lithium-ion technology that we have now. So th those are the challenges. And then my second question I had to ask myself was, why, why develop motorcycles? Why, why is the motorcycle the right thing to start off with electric vehicles? And really, it's from, personally, it was a lot more fun. I think motorcycles are just more fun than cars. So. There you have it. It's quicker to develop because they're very simple vehicles with an engine and a drivetrain. You know, just developing a car, it, it, just, it, it also is a challenge that, that I don't think I could do because there's so many parts to making a car and making it you know, robust and not squeaky and the heating and all of the cabin and the noise quality issues of designing a car it really is difficult, but motorcycles are much quicker to develop. And they also have lower price points. When, and when we, we, we talked about this a lot uh, with the state government level, is that there's always this, uh, with any trend or uh, electric vehicle change, um, there has to be a low co cost, a uh, gateway kind of device that really lets these vehicles become mass market. You know, it's like Henry Ford, right? I mean, there were gas cars before Ford made the Model T. But they didn't really have a lot of sales because they were just at such an elevated price point. What Ford did was bring in automation, bring a Model T down to everyone's price point. Everyone could buy it. And then cars, you just saw them flourish, gas engine cars. And that's really what I wanted to do here is to be the Ford of uh, electric motorcycles uh, or electric vehicles, to bring an electric vehicle down to a price point that's palatable to you know, everyday consumers. We have um, a street bike at $10,000 and an off-road bike at $7,500, and that's... You know that's a little bit of an elevated price point uh, compared to their gas counterparts, but it's really not. It's really not too bad. Um, the double-edged sword here is that the low price point uh, also meant that uh, the, you had to watch the cost of goods sold, the cogs uh, of these products, really carefully. You had to. I had to 
use a lot of my experience with mass production. And you know, as you see, and I'd, I'd been in the bicycle industry, I'd been designing motorcycles also in the motorcycle industry. I'd use a lot of my manufacturing contacts and manufacturing techniques uh, in order to bring down the cost so we could, we could develop a product that is not only the right price, but the right technology and the right performance. Uh, combining all of those three things. Combining them to be fun. This is a, a picture of my, my son, and I, I just like to, to show this picture just because it, it really is the essence of our company, and that's you know, having fun and being virtuous at the same time as being environmental and having, having it all, really having a fun vehicle. You know, I'm, I like performance vehicles. I like motorcycles. Um, you know, uh, driving a real economy car just, you know, doesn't really... Uh, uh, just doesn't really get me excited, and uh, you know, riding a, like an electric scooter or a Segway. You know, it's it's an interesting product. I like the Segway is a great example. It's a great product and uh, great technology, but you know, going 15 miles an hour on the sidewalk and getting stopped by little curbs and stuff like that, it's not something I I really wanted to do. It's not fun, and I know from developing consumer products for for all these years is that you know. It, when it comes to selling something, and it's something that needs to be a gateway vehicle to really change people's minds about electric vehicle technology, it's really got to, you got to combine fun and styling and, and make a great looking vehicle to, to get people used to the technology and to accept it, to accept the new paradigm in spite of the fact that it's, you know, that's new and unknown. So I wanted to make something exciting, fun performance, uh, great looking product in order to, to win people over and so they change their minds about electric vehicles and, and get, this, get this electric vehicle revolution going. But there was a battery problem. So this is a lithium ion cell and uh, this is a, of course far better than any lead acid batteries we had out there but um, because it, it has you know many times more power to weight density than lead acid batteries but um, at the time a few years ago uh, the state of the art was these lithium ion cells that had these uh, welded tab technology, and uh, uh, it's not something that I. Uh, that, that this is something that I, I really considered a problem. I still consider this a problem for all the electric vehicles out there that have this welded tab technology. It's because you've got this problem with a lithium-ion battery, and you guys are probably a little familiar with this with the Sony laptop problem. Is that lithium-ion batteries? If you get them too hot, they'll just explode into flame. And yet you have to have this problem of how do you attach a conductive tab onto these batteries? You know, usually you do it with a resistance welder and you get the battery hot and that itself destroys the battery. And the more current you want to carry through this welded tab, the thicker you have to make it. But then the thicker you make the tab, you've got to weld it on with more and more heat. And you can get around it with some, some different ways, but I wanted to come up with a, a way that we could conduct a huge amount of current from these batteries uh, and do so uh, in a way that would cool the battery at the same time. And that's the, that's the essence of our technology here, which is a way to... Uh, uh, have a highly conductive um, current carrier that's just mechanically uh, um, fastened to the battery instead of being welded on there. So we don't destroy the battery in the welding process and, uh, and allows us to use a huge, huge current carrier. So our battery packs, our battery packs can carry up to 300 amps through them, uh, which is a, a crazy amount of amperage. Uh, you know, the, the frames, we weld these frames at 220 amps. Uh, of current in order to melt the, the metal. So, you know, we, we have big fat cables uh, inside of this battery and we're carrying huge amounts of currents, uh, huge amounts of current through this thing to get all the performance that we want to get, you know, because current, there's a lot of very vari uh, variables in an electric motor, but basically you can think about it as current is equal to torque uh, in an electric motor and voltage is equal to the RPM. So the more current you have, the more torque you have, the more torque you have, the more acceleration you're going to get on, on your vehicle. I mean, obviously, you can, you can trade off torque for RPM by re-gearing it, but if you want to have lots of torque and not have a, a drivetrain where you have to gear down, you know, from a huge amount of revolutions, RPMs, to a very small amount of RPMs, which take a multiple stage uh, gear reduction in unit. If you want to do it in a single gear reduction, uh, then you're really pinned by having to do a, um, uh, lots of, having to do, have a battery pack that has lots of current output. So that's the nucleus of our technology was this high current uh, conductor, but it really wasn't the only thing that we had to develop. Uh, we had to develop we had to develop superiority in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, we have the the cleanest battery, like I said, with this, all this electric power and current capacity. Uh, we also used a, a, a landfill-approved battery that's a Canadian-made cell. That little cell you saw before. 
Uh, that's typically made with cobalt or other toxic metals. And we found one that uh, is made in Canada, which is all clean. It's a, you know, the, um, the metals are bound tightly with a salt molecule. So that uh, it's actually landfill approved in both the United States and Canada. And I like to say uh, that you can, you can actually eat it, <laughs> even though I've never ate one. But it, it's, a, it's so clean and, and non-toxic, you can actually eat the battery. But we had to combine that with not only the cleanest and most powerful battery technology, is, is really wanted to combine it with the lightest weight structure and the lightest overall vehicle weight. Because one of the problems with electric vehicles, you know, and just to kind of use the Tesla motor car as an example, is if you just take a car, like they're converting a Lotus uh, rolling chassis and putting an electric motor and battery in it, if you convert an electric vehicle, or convert a gas vehicle, excuse me, to um, electric, you end up with a vehicle that's heavier than the gas vehicle because it's not really designed to be an electric vehicle. It's not designed to have the, the powertrain correctly. It's designed for a lot of vibrational resistance because their engine's always shaking everything apart in the car. So there's a lot of structural requirements which are unnecessary. And you've also, uh, because the powertrain is so light, uh, the electric powertrain, the, the gas-powered cars are designed with all this structure for carrying this heavy gas engine and the fuel tank in there. You really need to design something from a clean sheet. And that's what, what I wanted to do, was custom design thin wall aluminum frames. And this is where I used my uh, techniques in the mountain bike industry to make really the lightest weight aluminum frames and the lightest weight uh, aluminum components. And that puts, puts the vehicle weight in, like our off-road bikes weigh 150 pounds and their corresponding gas bike weighs about 250 pounds when it's, when it's full of gas. So it's, it's a little bit more than half the weight. And this street motorcycle you see here is um, 225 pounds, and the corresponding gas motorcycle is maybe four to 500 pounds. Um, so it's a lot lighter. And then that lets us use a much smaller battery pack. Because the problem here is that the, the, co if the cost problem that I talked about is that the electric vehicle, it has a very expensive battery pack. And if you want to minimize the amount of battery pack that you need for the vehicle, you've really got to go through the painstaking process of dividing, uh, designing all the components around it custom to be really light so you can get away with the smallest battery pack you can possibly use. So you get the most range out of it, the most performance. And for motorcycles, there's a safety aspect because 85% uh, of injuries are when the motorcycle falls on your leg and breaks your leg. So it's, it's, they're quite dangerous when they're heavy. And this is being at 225 pounds. Can you step back in front of the podium? Sure. I can't hear you when you're away Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, uh, with the motorcycles, they're, when they're lighter, they're a lot easier to ride, to handle better, and they're a lot safer. So uh, it, it's a, a lot of safety advantages, performance advantages, and cost advantages to, to custom making lightweight aluminum vehicles, which are, are ground up uh, kind of projects. And that really gives us the most performance. And then, like I said, I think, I think for uh, electric vehicles, we, there really needs to be this watershed electric vehicle that, uh, that just trounces gas motorcycles or cars. It really has better performance, is lighter, and is safer. And the, the operating cost, of course, of the electric vehicles is a fraction that of a gas, uh, the gas counterpart. I haven't really put up there the cheapest because it doesn't sound good, but our electric vehicles are about a penny per mile to operate, and they're, it just, it's almost free. You can ride around. Most tip motorcycle riders ride about 10,000 miles a year, so it's $100 worth of electricity for the all year riding around. Um, it's, just, it's just free to ride electric vehicles because it's so efficient that it converts electric force to propulsive force um, you know, very, very cleanly with 90 plus percent efficiency. Uh, so it's, it's also the cheapest, and making our company and with a new product that really is very reliable, we don't have the service burden of changing oil, changing fluids, is I wanted to make a different kind of uh, company. And really, the last item is really about customer service. And I think we had an opportunity to, to really work with our customers and provide them the latest technology and, and uh, updates for their motorcycles. One of my design um, um, paradigms that I used was that I wanted to make a modular motorcycle that, that has a completely modular engine, a modular battery pack, a suspension very easy to work on to, to get change the parts. And th this is something that the automobile industry has totally forgotten about. And it's something that I read about um, with Honda, Honda's first products they brought to the United States. And one of the reasons he was able to make huge inroads on, on Detroit was that the, the early Hondas were really easy to work on, very modular, easy to repair. And mechanics loved working on early Hondas because not only were they high performance, high technology, but he spent the extra time 
to make it so you could service the things and get the things replaced. And, and when you're a new brand and you're a new customer, you're buying a new un, you know, motorcycle you haven't heard of, you, you don't want to have to worry about fixing it. You want to have a clear uh, path to getting a replacement part and putting it in yourself or having a mechanic do it and then having it just take a few seconds. So you want to have, you want to have a motorcycle that's really uh, upgradable and is durable and serviceable. And Detroit, unfortunately, I, you know, I think we're all familiar with this, is really all about planned obsolescence, about making these cars that are difficult to work on, difficult to upgrade, that will last a finite amount of time. And uh, it's really a, a, a sad state. Um, you know, I, I, uh, being in the aircraft industry, I, I love telling this story, is that uh, you know, the aircraft industry is actually the same way. I mean, we, as engineers, we have directives not to make airframes that last forever. Like uh, one of our case studies is the Douglas, I think it was Douglas DC-3. Remember those old airplanes? And you see them still flying around Africa. And that was a company failure because they made these airframes that last forever. Basically, you could fly a DC-3 forever. A hundred years from now, you can put new engines in that thing. And that was a financial failure because people never had to buy another DC-3 ever. And at, at that point, they started teaching engineers, you had better make an airframe that has a limited life cycle uh, 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 limited lifespan because we're never going to sell another airplane again and it's that philosophy really has gone over to almost every consumer product we have nowadays uh, but especially in the automobile industry. Yeah, but aren't, I mean, aren't these air, like you were studying aerodynamics, I mean the yeah. aerodynamics in the past 20 years have changed dramatically too. Absolutely. And I mean those, those DC-3 wing shapes and foils are not as efficient or not as, you know, don't work as well as the modern uh, airplane would so they, they are obsolete in, in their own way too. Yeah, by technology. Although, you know, you, you still... That's the other yeah. a lot of automobiles, and people are afraid of batteries becoming obsolete, and the controllers becoming obsolete, mm -hmm. right. like that. Yes, absolutely. That's a really good point. And what, we, we have, what we've done here, I, I can't walk away from the mic, but that we have a modular battery pack. You see the big square white thing? And basically, we've put all the electronics in one easy-to-service box. And uh, when it comes time to upgrade, um, I've, really, I've, really, uh, I've really forced our... our our frame designed to be around this modular battery system that also holds all of the like, controller uh, and uh, battery electronics. And so when it comes time, time to upgrade or re replace the battery pack, it really is like changing a fla flashlight battery. It's about building in our components in a modular system so that the parts that, that do become obsolete, like the battery pack, like you said, can be upgraded. But the things like the frame, um, you know, I mean, frame design and technology really it hasn't had a lot of shifts in uh, you know, how things are constructed for quite a long time. I mean, you have, you have subtle refinements, but I mean, the, the, the chassis and the uh, you know, all aluminum uh, frame design and swing arm design and the shock uh, and suspension, I mean, it's, it's, it's evolved very slowly over the years, but you're right. You're, you're not going to see wholesale changes in the frame. I think this, this frame, I've tried to incorporate every modern manufacturing technique and structural technique into it. Uh, I think our customers will be riding, riding this frame for, gosh, you know, 10, 10 years, 20 years. But you're right, it, changing the con motor controllers out, batteries out, um, is a really big, uh, uh, a big concern of our customers. And it's something I wanted to build in the motorcycle is to have everything, everything modular. So when we do the instrument cluster, it's an instrument cluster with a big plug on the backside. And you just, two bolts, you take that in in instrument cluster out. And when we come up with new microprocessors to stick in that thing, and give you better fuel gauge and warning lights and, and electronics inter and rider interface systems, uh, you can just throw that out or recycle it and we can provide the latest technology for you. Speaking of which, one of the things I've, I've really been excited with is you know, some sort of a, a Google phone app uh, of just being able to put use a Google phone as a, a dashboard where we just stick that in the front and maybe you can make a phone call and get your maps and where you're going and also have the, uh, your speed readout and trip distance and things like that, really incorporating uh, the motorcycle to, be, uh, to work with you know, consumer electronics like, uh, like a Google phone or an iPhone or something like that. Really, really we're, we're, we're really doing this, um, I think, in order to get good, good customer service because I, I think the problem with all these electric vehicles that are coming out, they really aren't designing to be very upgradable or uh, very friendly. And this is a big barrier to getting people to adopt this, is this fear of buying it, something that's going to be obsolete. So we really want to work really closely with our customers to provide great service, upgrade their bikes, uh, give them all the up latest updates, whether it's software or hardware, and uh, you know, keep their bikes on the road.
Yeah, I think we're. Yeah, I think we're I think we're upgrading. We're changing our warranty policy a little bit. Obviously, we have you know if there's any defects, you know we'll take care of it 100%. Um, and then we have uh, we're working towards a, a no fault warranty. I've, I've used this in industry. This is something new. I don't think I don't think we have on the site, but we're we're working to it towards a, a no fault warranty policy. And that's where uh, for a little extra money you can purchase a no fault warranty. And then no matter what happens to your motorcycle, and you know, guys who've owned motorcycles, you know this, these things go down, they get crushed and they fall off the back of your car, <laughs> whatever. There's, there's these things, you know, they, motorcycles have things happen to them. And uh, the no-fault warranty has been a really big success with other companies where uh, no matter what happens to it, if, if someone runs into it when, they're par when it's parked, you know, we'll replace it at cost. You know, you can get yourself a whole new motorcycle at two years if you want, you know, if you feel like you really uh, want to upgrade the whole entire thing. So I think we're working on a 10% increase in the purchase price. So our that's one of the warranty programs we're going to have. We have um, our one year, or I think we obviously have a, we have a, you know, a, we'll forever warranty the motorcycle against defects. That's not a problem. Um, and then a, a, as for normal use, wear and tear, I believe our, our warranty right now is one year uh, all inclusive. And then we'll, uh, all the components have their individual manufacturer's warranties, uh, which, are, which are really good. We have had no problems with our vendors replacing parts. And if our, our vendors have a problem, replacing the fork or anything like that, then we just usually, we suck it up and give customers new forks and we'll deal with the vendors. So we have a, a customer service person at our company and this is something I really uh, uh, wanted to grow the company around is where you could call us up and ask questions about your motorcycle and get really good answers from the factory. Being a motorcycle customer all these years, I'm always frustrated with my Honda or Kawasaki. You know, you, these, the dealers know nothing really about the technology, what's going on, and you, you can't ever ask them what the right thing is to do. They barely know how to fix the bikes. So it's, we've gotten great feedback from our customers that they can call our company and get somebody who assembles these bikes all day, get the straight answer and what to do, and then they'll usually send a part out, send a, if there's a problem, they'll send a replacement part out even before the customer sends their, their old part back to get them hot swap off uh, replacement parts. So, you know, we've, we've been selling our bikes like on Amazon.com and you can read the feedbacks. We've got all five star feedback and you know, we really try to take care of our customers because we have a model that we don't sell through dealerships because I, I, I tried to sell these motorcycles through dealerships and it really wasn't a good customer service experience. The customers really complained because the dealers really didn't know the technology and I really had to take it on myself to make uh, a good customer service department in our company. and. Uh, we have great local reps like uh, like George here uh, that'll handle all technical questions and service aspects, let you demo ride the bikes, and and really uh, really help you with the motorcycle. And and then plus we're it doesn't hurt that we're just in Scotts Valley, so you can always come over to the shop and and uh, get your bike looked at. And you know we really uh, really like to work closely with our customers, especially these early early adopters, to help them work through any is issues and. A lot of our customers like to make modifications and things like that, and uh, you know, so we, we like to uh, we like to see what our customers are doing to our motorcycles too. So, just a little bit about our products. Uh, we started with off-road motorcycles mainly because, really, the off-road motorcycle sector is is something that that needed quiet operation. Uh, you guys probably remember, like, when I started the business, like the first couple months after I started uh, selling these motorcycles, there was a, a, a a couple that, that strung a chain up across the dirt road in Los Gatos because the dirt bikers were coming by their house uh, every Sunday morning at like 8 and waking him up. And they got so tired, they strung a chain across. And it, it caught the dirt bike rider and gave him like 115 stitches across his neck. Almost killed the guy and the couple, you know, uh, got uh, charged with manslaughter, attempted manslaughter. It was, it's just a horrible situation. But it really highlights the problem with off-road riding and normal gas motorcycles. They're loud and obnoxious. and and I love a loud, obnoxious motorcycle, but my, my neighbors hate the motorcycles. And my, my kids, I have young kids, they hate the noisy motorcycles too. So even my wife doesn't like the noisy motorcycles. So they, they had to go, and we needed a silent way to enjoy off-road riding, uh, something that was also lightweight that didn't leave a, a big footprint. So we developed the off-road products really to service this need for uh, you know, something quiet. You could ride on your own property or county property or um, places that... Uh, uh, that, that really just can't have the noise because uh, most people don't realize that off-road riding is not te not technically illegal. It's the noise. It's what they the no there's noise ordinances in most coast most 
coastal counties, even some of the inland counties, have passed noise ordinances. And really, you're violating noise ordinances when you ride off-road vehicles. And that's what the ticket's for. And that's what you can actually get arrested for. That's a pretty monster rear sprocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is part of the, the problem of gearing down from a high RPM electric motor to the rear wheel. You need to slow down this this uh, mechanism a lot, and that's why that's why we wanted to go with low voltage, lower turning, lower um, RPMs per volt motors that, that required a lot of current, and that's why we had to develop this battery pack that puts out a lot of current, so we could spin our motor slow enough to drive our vehicle forward. Oh yeah. That's a good question. These lithium ion batteries have a very flat voltage profile. So they're not like lead acid batteries before the olden days where you just get, or nickel, uh, nickel NICAD batteries, which just continually deteriorate the voltage. These, these have initially, they have a little voltage drop, but then they have this really wide, stable platform. So our motorcycles are very even powered all the way through their charge, right to the very end where it just starts dropping off power. But uh, it's just one of the inherent things about lithium power is it's very, very nice and even all the way to the end. Yeah. And, but I mean, high currents are less, a lot less efficient. You, you've got to burn a lot It is true. I mean, uh, but I think that, yeah, getting, getting it hot. But, e but even, even less efficient electric motors are still 90 plus percent efficient, you know, versus 94. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it doesn't really affect your range that much. But you're right. There is a problem of dumping off the heat uh, with these electric motors, which is why, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're constantly working with electric motor manufacturers to get really good high performance permanent magnet motors, which is what the, uh, drives these vehicles because they're very light, very small, and can take very high current. This is just an example of how light our off-road frame is. It's just the whole frame is 18 pounds, including the rear shock. It's just feather light. And this, this frame you see here, this is all um, hollow aluminum, and it's like three times thicker than a Coke can. It's really light and incredibly strong. Uh, just, it's, it's just feather light, 28 pounds for all that uh, frame and rear shock. And... Uh, Someone asked earlier, this is our first, about, about the supermoto, this is our first street bike, which is a bit of an off-road slash street uh, motorcycle. Supermoto is a style of motorcycling which is popular in France. Uh, it's called supermotard. And it was this racing circuit where you had to drive on the, on the road circuit and then do a little bit of dirt and then do a jump because everybody loves seeing jumping. But I, I wanted to develop this because uh, in San Francisco, especially, uh, you really need to get your motorcycle up and down curbs, you know, if you want to park it. And the, one of the joys about having a motorcycle in the Bay Area is that you can park on the curb, you know, park anywhere. It's, it's just great. You can ride it up. And, you know, I've taken this to the city and ridden motorcycles around the city so much. It's just so great to park it right in front of a restaurant, get it up on a curb, and go up and down stairs if you need to. I've taken our motorcycles into elevators and up and down stairways and uh, all over the city. We've taken it in the building and everywhere because it's clean and there's no flammable liquids in it, so technically actually you can take it in a lot of elevators, a lot of freight elevators in the, uh, in the city. So you take it inside, and Supermoto is a great uh, first product for our company because it's kind of a new stylish uh, kind of motorcycle. And uh, I think you guys would really, you know, it's, 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 if you haven't ridden Supermoto before, it's really fun because it's a lot of suspension travel, like an off-road bike, but you can, it's fully street legal with street tires. You have an incredible amount of grip you can go around fast. And supermoto motorcycling is not about high speed. It's not like a, a GSX-R1000 where you're, you know, you're trying to go 200 miles an hour or something nutty like that. It's really about um, going around traffic, riding in an urban environment where you really are doing a l mostly city streets where you're actually averaging 12 miles per hour. But you want to get stoplight to stoplight really fast. You want to get up and down the curb to park your motorcycle. Uh, you might do a little bit of freeway travel with it, you know, just zip on the freeway to go a couple exits. But it's really for the urban commuter, and that's why this product is a, the first product I wanted to develop is the Supermoto because it's go anywhere. It's made for urban environments. We're also going to have a hard bags, uh, hard luggage for this thing. It's really, really excited about that. So it's really useful, and you can have the fun, and it's a penny per mile to, to operate. And uh, um, you can, it's, a, it's just a fun kind of motorcycling. You, you were saying something about top speed. This has a pretty low top speed. It does. Yeah, this is a, a, has a 60 mile to, an hour top speed. You can change it a little bit. You can re-gear it for a little more top end. 
uh, but then you lose the acceleration the taller you gear it up. And the reason I wanted to do that is because it doesn't have a transmission. So it's a, it's, it, it's a single uh, front and rear sprocket. And I wanted to do that just for simplicity. I mean, obviously, I could make it. This has enough power to push well past 100 miles an hour. But for one thing is you, you do go 100 miles an hour, the air resistance is phenomenal, and your range is going to be terrible. So it's not the most range efficient thing to do is to be riding at 100 miles an hour. Uh, and I, so I think the, the problem of not being able to go really fast is, is, is not really, when you use it on a daily basis, it really isn't that big of a deal. Um, it's really made for these little short commutes where you're going to the grocery store, going to work, going to get lunch. Um, you know, if you, uh, if you want to ride for more than an hour in some place, really most people take a car. I mean, I ride tens of thousands of miles each year, but if I have to go someplace more than an hour, usually I, usually I end up taking my car anyway. So it's a great addition to a, a car, not really to take the place of cars and replace your main vehicle. And just a, a picture of the, the bare frame, the technology here we're doing is just the all aluminum uh, frame structure with the really you know, lightweight components. And uh, to, it's interesting that this, this technology is uh, called hydroforming. And what it is is it's an aluminum tube, and you put uh, high pressure water in it, and you put the tube inside of a mold, and it expands out and makes any, really any shape you want. It's an incredible technology. They've used that in the automobile industry for a while, and you see it in other, uh, the mountain bike industry. And it really is, um, for some reason, the motorcycle industry has really been slow to adopt uh, this kind of technology that other industries have, have gone to. I think it's uh, because a lot of the traditional aspect of motorcycling uh, you know, really hasn't called for this new frame designs, and, and nobody really wants to push the technology barrier. Um, and frankly, the gas motorcycles really haven't had the need to be lighter. Uh, it really is just the electric motorcycles that really have this need for a lightweight motorcycle because you have a limited amount of power and a limited amount of range in the battery pack. You need to maximize range and range of performance by getting the, the weight down. And it also is about, of course, using the least amount of raw materials possible when you're your automobile or your motorcycle, you know, if you want to be very green and be environmentally conscious, you really want to minimize the raw material usage in, in everything you do. So that's about it. And, and uh, you know, we have uh, uh, George here as our local sales contact. And, uh, you know, he could for sure answer more questions. And, you know, we, we're going to want to have some demo rides af after the talk here so you guys can come out and ride the bike. We got a couple bikes out in the parking lot. Um, and you can talk to George about, uh, uh, you know, if you want more demo rides and want to get your friends on the bikes, uh, you know, certainly, uh, certainly, uh, you know, I can come back and talk more uh, about any of the technology aspects. I know we just have an, an hour this time, but, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a really a lot that goes into this motorcycle that I haven't really talked about. We've, we've got innovative uh, parts and all kinds of designs for, for venting the batteries, for thermal venting of the batteries and, um, you know, rev you know, Kind of advancements of even even the brake pedal. I like to give an example. It's a it's a brake pedal with a hidden spring inside of it, um, just to make it neater and cleaner and, and nicer looking. It's a solid billet aluminum brake pedal. It's the lightest brake pedal uh, in the market. Same with the kickstand. It's the lightest kickstand. It's a hollow aluminum kickstand that we made to be very very lightweight. Uh, and be, and being very lightweight, uh, you know, doesn't require a big spring to hold it up. So there's a lot of little little things that. Uh, uh, you know, I could go on and on about uh, in this motorcycle, but we've got a lot of little, little design improvements, a lot of uh, uh, advancements in the battery technology and electronics that I think is, uh, you know, is really interesting. Is that a straight DC motor? This is a straight. This is a brushed DC motor. Um, yeah, and, and we've we've been experimenting around with some of the brushless motors because uh, it's a, one of the things people ask about is what about brushless motors? And the the brushed motors, unfortunately, they, they've been around for so long. They've really developed. Reliab really high reliability for brush motors. They last like seven years in between brush changes. They just last a long time. So we've had really good luck, and we haven't changed over to the brushless technology just, just because these are so uh, proven to be uh, reliable motors. So it is a DC motor controller, and then it just shoots straight DC electricity into the uh, brush DC motor. So it's very, very simple, and it's also very cost effective because these kind of motors and controller setups have been around in golf carts for decades. So uh, it's a very robust, very reliable motor controller we use. That just, it, frankly, it's it's hard to change it, change from it because it is so crazy reliable. It's been in the market for 
for 15 years. It's got a great track record. They have great service. And uh, we've tried lots of brushless motors, and they're very finicky and all kinds of software problems with getting them working. And the reliability is just, reliability is terrible. One of the things you don't want to have happen is a runaway electric vehicle where you know, it goes to full throttle. The brushless motors are really finicky about their software and their uh, how they control because it's obviously a brushless motor is a, a all software controlled speed controlled motor. It's it's when the software goes down or freezes, it's a, it can put you in a dangerous situation. So a brushed motor is a lot more robust and proven. Is the uh, charger built in or is it an external unit? This one has perfect. Google is paying for your, <laughs> your transportation costs. Yeah, there's an outlet. There's a plug uh, right on the left side of the motorcycle. You just plug it into any wall outlet. One of the great things about an electric motorcycle is you don't need a specialized charging station. It only takes about 10 amps uh, of uh, current. I, that, actually, it's a little bit more. It's like 15 amps. It's, it's a 1,000 watt charger at 110, so it's a, you know, it's a little bit more. Uh, but it, 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 it's, it's enough uh, it's low enough current so that you can run lights on the same outlet and still not cause a circuit breaker to pop. Uh, you can plug it anywhere at the home or any just any household outlet will be fine. Uh, and that's a big advantage for an electric vehicle, especially a new electric vehicle where you don't have charging stations everywhere. Uh, I just got back from Paris. I did a PR tour in Paris. And the city, the, uh, they have like 20,000 outlets in Paris, and they're planning on putting a lot more. And it's, like, it's pretty amazing. You can plug in your electric vehicle almost at any street corner in Paris. And, uh, uh, it's amazing Europe is so progressive as far as electric vehicles go and you know we're we're probably going to sell half of our motorcycles in, in Europe because they are so much more appreciative of clean technology and of course their their land that they have and the air that they have is, is much more limited than the United States uh, but you know we're excited to sell to the American market because people really want these electric vehicles and they really want it to work and you know the sales have been really fantastic we we had a six month back order list for all of our off-road products last year and I'm sure we're going to sell out. We've already, we've already worked through a lot of the sales uh, on this S-Bike which is we're going to start shipping this in a few weeks uh, once we get our certifications and uh, we've already got a long uh, back order list for these bikes so um, it's, it's really going to be exciting. So um, one of the tough things with any new vehicle company is always making money and uh, with, with selling out your production is company profitable? Well, <laughs> actually, um, you know, from a business standpoint, it actually it is because I do have a lot of experience um, doing mass production of, of these kind of products. I mean, um, in the bike industry, I've, I've, I've got probably five or ten percent of the market, the, the designs that I've made in the high end of the full suspension market. So I'm used to selling, you know, tens of millions of dollars with a product and, and getting it that kind of manufacturing going. Um, so although this is a very uh, elaborate and high-tech manufacturing technology. It's also very simple to mass produce. And, uh, you know, I'm working with the largest fork manufacturers in the world, the largest rim manufacturers in the world. We're already are in mass production for this thing. So it's a lot different than, than buying these custom cars or something that's a one-off thing. It's, uh, we have a lot of experience at zero uh, sourcing uh, these components from the biggest manufacturers in the world. And we have volume production going already. Uh, so even though, um, even though this year we have a limited quantity of these uh, available, I mean, next year our plan is, of course, to, to keep on growing the production units uh, up. At the same time, I don't want to overextend our company and make 10,000 of these in the first year. We want to uh, keep a limited number so we can make sure we can sell out, uh, make sure we keep track of our customers. Again, this customer service thing is a big issue with me. I don't want so many customers we can't answer the phone or I can't answer the phone personally if someone has a problem. Um, so I think in this first year we have to really uh, it's not about just making motorcycles. It's about putting in the whole customer service infrastructure and making sure all of our guys can answer all the questions uh, and then maybe next year make a lot more motorcycles so we can service all of the people we have, uh, all the customers we have out there. Your current production volumes are and your anticipated so this one we've made 600 of these and that's, that's for, slotted for this year. And the off-road we have I think 400 of the motorcycles. So right around 1,000 is, uh, is all we're going to uh, sell for this year. Uh, under typical usage, about five years, you've got a, you got a, uh, you know, it, the, the, it's, it's hard to, to exactly calculate because, uh, um, you know, it, it, it depends on how deeply you discharge it, whether you maintain it properly, uh, and how hot the environment is. Heat has a tremendous uh, deteriorating effect to these batteries, but it, you know, we say around five years, and 
Um, and really, though, the, the truth is I think that the technology uh, is advancing so quickly. Uh, like I, I talk with a lot of startups here in the Valley and uh, um, talking with a lot of bat battery manufacturers, technology manufacturers, and, and they're coming out with really much better batteries even the next year. Um, so even though I think these batteries will last quite a long time, I think we will be, up, we'll be upgrading our customers' batteries sooner than they're, they're, they're done. You know, in, in probably every other year, every third year, we'll probably just upgrade customers' batteries because you'll be able to get longer range and more life cycle, and we'll offer those upgraded batteries at cost. And the cost of these things is just going down, down, down every, every year. So it's pretty incredible. I, I'm not really worried about giving out free batteries or cost, at cost batteries in a couple of years now, years from now when people need to have the newest technology in their motorcycles. We'll have a good relationship with our customers and provide good customer service that way. What proportion of the cost of your vehicle is that? Right now it's half. <laughs> so that's an excellent question. Right now, it's, lithium ion is just incredibly expensive. Uh, but like I said, it's, it, it's coming down about 20% a year. Uh, it didn't come down at all actually last year because so many companies got into the electric vehicle space and car companies wanted to do electric vehicles. Uh, and then ba lithium, ion ba lithium ion batteries got in short supply. Uh, they got in such short supply that they actually stopped innovating the battery industry. But one of the good things about the recession, or maybe the only good thing about the recession, is that it's freed up battery supply. And so we've actually gotten some big discounts on new batteries. Plus, the, there's reason now for the battery companies to innovate because they want to have this competitiveness. Uh, it was a funny situation. It's an interesting story. Last year, there was actually so much demand for batteries the factories were running 364 days a year flat out, and all these companies in the in the valley they'd made these advancements of lithium ion batteries, and the manufacturers refused to install any of them because they could they were totally overbooked for the sales of the batteries last year's technology they already had, and we had a terrible time getting any of our manufacturers to in, to put in place any of the new technologies, but that totally changed around 180 degrees. Now all of a sudden they don't they can't sell all the batteries they make. They they need to competitive advantage versus the next guy because they're not selling every battery, you know, 364 days worth of production. So we're going to see a lot of, we're finally going to see a lot of battery technology advancements and a lot of cost uh, reductions on the, on the packs. Two questions. Uh, one is, are you using cylindrical or prismatic batteries? Yeah. And the other question is, um, what's the asymptotic uh, cost of these things? What, what sets the lower limit on it? What, is, what would you estimate the yeah, I don't think there is a real low limit. I think it's like microprocessors. It's, I think it's uh, you're going to get about. I've made the graph. It's about 20% deterioration for capacity dollars per watt hour, if you will, or uh, of capacity. 20% uh, deterioration in that in that equation. So you can either get 20% more capacity at the same cost next year, or you can get it just the same battery pack next year, 20% less. But I think that the technology keeps advancing. There's, there's so many different advances ar just around the corner. Uh, little, little technology increases that give us 20% more capacity or uh, you know, a little bit more power output and, or reduce reduction in cost. Um, I know probably, I know about 10 companies in the Valley that have technology that just needs to be uh, integrated into battery pack systems. And the other thing that happened with the battery industry in general is that uh, two years ago, a lot of the venture capital guys got into investing in battery factories, factories and they're just about to become online uh, with new factories that, uh, that can meet the demand of, uh, the, you know, future demand for electric vehicles and also will have this newer technology. So we've, we've been in this dry spell of, of supply on batteries, but that's just about to be over because we have, we have both new factories coming online plus a lot of new technology which is gonna drive uh, uh, prices down. And, uh, oh, and, this is a, and this is a cylindrical battery um, these, I, I, it, I, I wanted to use these batteries because it's the safest, by far the safest form factory. It's a steel encased battery. And I wasn't crazy about using these aluminum cased or, or even worse, those uh, lithium polymer batteries, which are like a Kool-Aid pouch battery pack. Because if you get a puncture in these batteries, uh, they will, you know, a puncture and a flame, they, they can go up in flames. And so I use a, a high pressure steel can cell. And that's been in use in the power tool industry and it's passed all these regulatory tests for, for dropping your power tools off of a 10-story building. And this, is a, this isn't your normal battery pack that's in the hand drill, but it's in the commercial products. Extremely high power, extremely vibration resistant, shock resistant, uh, impact resistant. And that's, that's the technology we prefer. It's a steel encased cell, and it's, of course, very clean.
So prismatics, I think, have their place, and I think it's, a, it's ex an exciting thing to think about. It's just there's the, there is the safety issue of the larger form factors as far as heat dissipating heat and impact. We, we just sold some bikes to the U.S. military, and we have to, we have to take rounds from hypersonic bullets uh, through this thing. So, Crazy. You know, but that's, uh, it's really an interesting story. The, uh, the guys in Afghanistan, the, the real problem with their uh, electric ATVs and, and mo gas motorcycles is not that they need a silent motorcycle. I was really flabbergasted. What the problem is is these gas uh, motorcycles, they, they put them on the outside of their personnel carriers, and the snipers, that's the first thing they shoot is the gas can out of it. And they're just tired of having these flaming things outside the vehicle <laughs> because, uh, you know, they, they, they absolutely don't want to put them inside because obviously you get a, a round inside the vehicle and an exploding gas can, you just killed everybody inside the vehicle. So they're, they're certainly not going to put these things on the inside. They want them on the outside. And when they're outside and the extra gas cans, they just get shot up immediately and the, the thing's a big mess. So they're really excited about this thing that there's nothing to blow up and, uh, and it's kind of sniper proof. Uh, Time, so. Okay. Oh no, it won't work. But they just don't want a flaming mess <laughs> outside. Outside the outside the. <laughs>